Good afternoon, everyone. And here are my slides. So the historical epoch that we call the Middle Ages lasts about a thousand years, from roughly the 5th to the 15th century. In common parlance, the Middle Ages are often referred to as a dark time, allegedly a period of prejudice, of abstruse intellectual inquiries that would stand in sharp contrast with the progressive and civilizing zest of modernity, the so-called age of reason. Now, labeling the Middle Ages as dark is incorrect. Modern notions about the state are rooted in medieval political thought and political practice. Contemporary and modern art owes a great debt to Byzantine and medieval taste for abstraction, and even several branches of the modern sciences, including optics, as we will see in a moment, originate in the pioneering work of medieval scholars. What is most ironical is that during the so-called Dark Ages, scholars, artists, and the broader communities were keenly interested in light. This begs the question, why should we care about medieval light or darkness? Well, the language of darkness and light permeates the contemporary debates in the social and political arena. You have noticed that the media routinely comment on our alleged return to the Middle Ages or on the fact that we are going through a dark time. However, there is nothing dark about the Middle Ages, as we will see today. I will run with the metaphor of darkness, not because I think that the Middle Ages were dark, but because I think that over the course of a millennium that we refer to as the Middle Ages, individuals and communities did encounter periods of uncertainty or phases of instability. They, like us, occasionally groped in the dark. So how did they orient themselves in the face of the unknown? Well, first of all, they lit up the dark with what they'd got. Ten elegantly dressed and beautifully accessorized women decorate either sides of the portal of the north transept of Magdeburg Cathedral in Germany. They were made in the late 13th century, and they were set up in their current positions in the early 14th. If we have a closer look at these ladies, we'll notice that half of them are weeping desperately. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the portal, the other ladies are smiling joyfully. So what is it that we're looking at exactly? What we're looking at is the very end of a tale about light and dark, and about what it means to endure what we do not have control over. The 10 ladies of the story were expecting somebody, but they weren't told when that somebody would arrive. It was dark and it was night, so they did what we would presumably all do. They lit up their lights and they readied themselves for the waiting. Time passed, nothing happened. More time passed, still nothing happened. And then eventually, all of a sudden, the guests that they were expecting did arrive. But by then, as you can see from this image by William Blake, half of the oil lamps were still feebly gleaming in the dark because their carriers had patiently recharged them with oil, resolute in their duty to keep vigil. But the other half of the oil lamps had died out because the owners had neglected, neglected to pack with them enough oil. So the women who were caught unprepared couldn't join in the party that their wiser companions were instead invited to. Hence, on the Magdeburg portal, the ones are overcome with grief, and the others smile on with joy. Now, this is a story that was well known in the Middle Ages, and it was often represented in sculpture, in painting, in mosaic, and it was used to convey important moral messages, for example, the significance of faith, or the importance of endurance. And yet, I would like us to forget for a moment the fact that we're looking at an image of religious edification, 
and focus instead on the literal aspect of the story. So with the aid of this blank or black slides, try and picture in your heads the tenacity of these women, the standing still in the midst of the dark, their fatigue after hours of waiting, the doubt as to whether it was worth waiting more, wasting so much oil, to wait for someone who might, in the end, not even arrive. Now, I don't think that under the circumstances it is particularly surprising that half of these women gave up. Probably we would have done the same. I think it is more surprising that the others did not, that they stood up late, they recharged their oil lamps, and they kept them going, bobbing in the dark. Now, let's look again at the portal in Magdeburg. These sculpted figures occupy a liminal space, suspended between the interior and the exterior of the building on either sides of the portal. They do not embody the complacent quiet of a life lived well. They express a dilemma the dilemma of establishing what it means to do right in the face of the unknown, and the ordinary strength that it takes to just stay the course in the darkest hour when we think nothing at all, and the need for hospitality and civility is strongest. Now, if the women in Magdeburg offer a powerful meditation about what it means to hold oneself when one sees nothing at all, well, what about when the shadows are gone? So how do we actually see and make sense of the world in full light? Now, brace yourselves, because this is going to be the toughest bit of my talk. According to modern optics, we receive the visual information through our eyes. Light penetrates the eye, hits the retina, and is then processed by our, our nervous system and then stored in the brain. In the Middle Ages, both Christian and Islamic, this theory coexisted with an opposite one called extra mission. As the name suggests, according to this model, our eyes do not so much receive as they emit light rays, and touching distant objects, they produce visual information. Now, the theory of extramission has been disproved by modern physics and by modern anatomy. But here's my provocation to you. What if the idea that sight as an active faculty that is akin to the sense of touch carried with, with itself a kernel of poetic, if not scientific, truth? Seeing and knowing are inextricably connected. And here you see what I mean in diagrammatic form in this medieval manuscript. The eyes are connected to the brain via the optical nerves. So seeing and knowing are inextricably connected. Now, from a modern standpoint, we are used to thinking about knowledge as a dispassionate activity that is predicated on the right amount of distance between us as knowing subjects and the objects of our inquiry. So, the more we are capable of removing ourselves and of impassionately examining what we see, well, the better we are able to know. By contrast, medieval vision theories stipulate that we, as viewers, are inevitably implicated in all activities of knowledge making. In order for us to see, our eyes need to reach out to the world and touch it, so this is where medieval knowledge begins, not in an act of severance, but in a decision to care. So if you're still with me, bear with me for another moment. So if this is all true, then if in order for us to know, our eyes must touch what we see and what we see must touch us in return, then doesn't it follow that knowledge rests not on an equanimous distance but on a contact of sorts. Knowledge bonds us to the world. We only really know what we allow ourselves to truly encounter 
And our only way to know is to walk out of ourselves and be transformed. Now, no other image captures the idea of change and transformation as accurately and powerfully as the rainbow. A medieval art is packed full of rainbows. This image you're seeing here comes from a 6th century manuscript produced in the Near East. It is one of the earliest surviving copies of the Bible, preserved in book format. And it is one of a handful of manuscripts written in silver ink on purple dyed parchment, which makes this manuscript incredibly precious. The image in the lower bottom of the page represents four men, the elderly Noah and his three sons. They're looking upwards towards a beautiful rainbow hovering in the sky. You will be familiar with the story already. In the previous page, Noah and his sons had just disembarked the ark that Noah had previously built in order to save his family and all the animal species that populated the Earth from a global flood that you see here that destroyed all life on the planet. Now, the amazed pose of the four men is not surprising. After 40 days of uninterrupted rain, the sky has finally cleared up. And they're looking at the very first rainbow that God created there and then to mark the end of the deluge and to celebrate his new alliance with humankind. We're all familiar with the particular joy of experiencing the rainbow. Piercing dark clouds with bright color, the rainbow materially, physically puts an end to storms. And so it represents for us the very essence of everything that is pure and beautiful, renewal, rebirth, hope. And yet, it is my contention that the biblical rainbow is not just an image of hope in the dark or a lesson in optimism against the great trials. When the rainbow is set up in the sky, God explains to Noah its meaning. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. This is a tale of danger. The clouds will forever assemble. Humanity is forever endangered, and all we have, what our safety clings on, is a rainbow. The most evanescent of atmospheric phenomena, an impalpable thing made of color and light. Fat chance we're going to survive. Yet, in all its poetic absurdity, this is a lesson in fury and what keeps it at bay. Let's look again at the manuscript page. Doesn't the rainbow look like a shield that protects humankind from God's wrath? Devastation will not occur because God, that holds the highest power to kill, holds, stops itself before the most diaphanous thing in the sky. Now let's forget the religious aspect for a moment, and let's focus on today. On the edge of tomorrow, we remain on the verge of destruction. And so here's perhaps, uh, from the dark ages, the mightiest uh, dispatch. What separates us from another flood is not only our ability to predict the rain. A different kind of wisdom is needed instead. A readiness of what is strong to commit to what is vulnerable and a preparedness, perhaps, from us to be ourselves a little bit like rainbows, fragile, hopelessly fugacious, to be sure, but also luminous and colorfully fearless. That's all it takes to shine against the clouds. Thank you. <laughs>